Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and I'm with Audrey Waters virtually. Hello. Hi, Audrey. Hey there. It's the 7th of December, 2012, and we actually have a live audience here in Phoenix, Arizona. It's Woo! Dingy. That's right, Derek. <laughs> 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 It's my last, it's the last city on the Hack Your Education Tour this year. Well, I am sorry that I couldn't make it to Phoenix, but since I just arrived um, back home late last night, I'm from where? From, from, pa- where? <laughs> from Paris. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> Needless Paris, to say, I'm, right? I wasn't really going to, uh, I wasn't too thrilled about turning the background and hopping on an airplane again. Well, we understand. Hey, so let's talk about, I wanted to talk about this restaurant analogy, Mm -hmm. food analogy, the one that you and I have sort of discussed several times in terms of started in that small bar restaurant. Where were we? Uh, San Francisco, I think. San Francisco, I think. Yes, because it was the food culture Mm -hmm. and I had gone to this vegan uh, Vietnamese place or Viet Thai place. And we were looking. We were thinking about sort of the rich food culture that exists in a city like that. And we were talking about how kind of McDonald's or the fast food would be sort of the equivalent non-nutritious version of a lot of the education sort of solutions or talk. Mm-hmm. So last week I stayed um, in, in LA with with some family friends who own a Mexican restaurant, second generation restaurant family, and it was really interesting to go into the restaurant because they have a cart and they. They come out and they make the guacamole right there. And they actually have in the front of the restaurant the original guacamole cart. And there are items on the menu that are named for patron restaurant. And there's this real community feeling. And it occurred to me that – and they have a McDonald's that's about a block from their restaurant. And I asked, you know, you know how, how is the restaurant business? And they said, you know, it's not a huge moneymaker. Right? I mean, family restaurant is always kind of touch and go. And uh, but the, I know what franchisees make at restaurants like McDonald's or Taco Bell, and it's a pretty penny, right? I mean, it's a, a it's a those are pretty lucrative. They can be very lucrative operations. Yeah. So so we got to talking about the difference between the kind of food culture in this family restaurant and getting McDonald's, and and I was thinking about you know if you measured food based on caloric output and profit. Mm-hmm. Right, you would build McDonald's, right? So, but it, but how do you measure the kind of food culture that would come that would that would bring out these kind of family restaurants or a vegan Thai restaurant or a, you know all of the kinds of things that we associate with a very rich food culture? So you were just in Paris, and, and it sounds like this is actually kind of a conversation right now, the food culture conversation. It was very interesting. I went out to lunch with actually my best friend from high school who I hadn't seen in 22 years. Um, but she purposefully chose a restaurant that was um, um, sort of a local foodie place for precisely this reason. And she said that even in Paris, particularly in the touristy places, that more and more restaurants um, were selling sort of pre the prepackaged uh, meals that that one might expect, you know, Americans to buy when they're in France. And so instead of sort of making the chocolate mousse from scratch, you, they they you know they're purchasing sort of vast tubs from these larger um, distributors. Um, and so this notion of like, what do you do to sustain? You know, what uh, what do you do to sustain a local food culture and the kinds of things that matter? I think it, it continues to make an interesting way of thinking about, you know, how we frame education and, you know, the business of education and what matters there. Yeah, because it, it, that is a really interesting parallel, right? Because if you say you were responsible for a city, if you were a city council or the mayor or something, and you really wanted there to be a rich food culture, what would you do? Right? I mean, what, what, what you can't mandate, Right. Uh, and, and, and maybe there is that parallel of mandating sort of ends up with the, the kinds of measurements that would lead to um, less nutritious, sort of more bland foods. Yeah, our mandate, mandate just doesn't seem for the, the solution for anything that, that requirements are passion, right? And so you can mandate. I mean, we, we mandate things all the time. I mean, no child left behind is the great mandate. But that doesn't, I mean, even if, you know, even if we sort of reach, reach those um, reach those goals, that's, is that even the right thing to be, to be measuring? 
Right. So it is intriguingly sort of this question of how do you create the conditions for something? Mm -hmm. And that goes back to this conversation you and I have had about sort of the, the, the pairing of the soil versus the harvest. Yeah. Sort of how do you create the conditions that would lead toward learning rather than coming up with a metric that, that, that demands a certain kind of uh, accomplishment that would be learning? Right. Well, I'm interested to see if that comes up a little. I, I kind of think it will. And the phrase that's been coming up in my mind is, uh, you know, we've used this red herring concept. Mm -hmm. and, and the red herring is clearly a fake. But, but are there uh, things equivalent to a red herring that are actually, you know, reasonable to strive for, but they're not the best? Right? So they're not really a fake, but they're almost like a surrogate for the more important issues. I and think, I, yeah, this is, I mean, I think that this is such a, this is, I think this is one of these huge challenges that, that, that we face in a number of areas and is particularly around education technology right now, where we look at things that um, on one hand sound as though they're opening access up, um, that they're, uh, that they're providing more opportunities for folks, um, but they don't, they don't feel, they feel like they're missing the mark in little ways that perhaps if they continue on that direction, they'll be giant ways. I mean, it's the difference between stopping in for, you know, McDonald's fries like once a year and then deciding that you're going to have McDonald's fries every Friday. Well, I want to use this as a way of introducing the code conversation. Right. right the learning to code. Because it feels to me like it is a little bit, it's, it's not a red herring. Right? Learning to code is a good thing. Mm -hmm. But it feels like it's a surrogate for deeper issues. And so the, the sort of it's like a bandwagon that, that gets jumped on and that may not actually be the full issue. So this is your third top trend of 2012, right? Learning right. to code. Learning to code. And that was, I mean, this was certainly at the beginning of the year, um, as I note in the piece, Code Academy, which is a New York-based learn to code startup, one of many, many, many learn to code startups, had us brilliant marketing um, uh, campaign to make 2012 code year. They sent out a thing just in time for folks who are choosing their New Year's resolutions to say this should be the year that you learn to code. It had a phenomenal sort of viral uptake with even Mayor Bloomberg tweeting that he was going to learn to code. And so it seemed on one hand to tap into this great excitement for online learning, for learning programming, um, for free, you know, for free, for free educational resources. Um, but you, I think what you're what you're alluding to is is that it doesn't it's not quite it's it is all those things and yet it's it's not quite any of them or it's not quite satisfactory for any of them it certainly seems like there are some very tangibly important issues there right um web literacy mm -hmm. um the the const constructivist kind of mentality uh, the, the the sort of papert like sense of what can happen with computers right but but the question I guess in my mind was how much was this driven by kind of the bandwagon effect and how much really do we feel like coding is a really critical issue? Well, I think – and I, I would the, – the bandwagon and the bubble as well. I mean I think if you look at, at three, of the, three of the startups who received more venture capital um, – in this year, they were all ostensibly learning to code startups. So Codecademy raised, I think, ten seven million dollars in the middle of the year. Uh, Udacity raised fifteen million. Coursera, which of course has other courses, but its founders are both um, engineers, they raised over twenty million dollars. So clearly, this is something that the Silicon Valley hype cycle was interested in, was really interested in. You could argue because they're perhaps as a shortage of highly skilled software engineers in Silicon Valley, but you could also see this sort of bubble and echo effect of um, the tail wagging the dog. Which isn't to say that learning to code is not an, is not an incredibly valuable thing to, to know, right? Totally. It's just that it may not be the core issue. And I think this is the conversation you and I have had about open source software. Right. I mean, it, um, in many ways, it sort of served for me as a surrogate for deeper educational issues um, and ended up not being the core issues, but for a period of time is, is sort of the focus. I think that that's, I mean, to me, you know, this was this was a topic that I did some, re you know, I worked, I did a little bit of research for Mozilla this year. And they are also very interested in teaching people web literacy, I would say, not just coding. But 
certainly again and again it felt as though instead of talking about the 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 paper constructivist sort of approach to things that we very much had learning to code for coding, coding sake rather than teaching people to you know to be able to identify and, and have their solve their own problems through 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 programming through hacking through programming through more sophisticated software engineering so it seemed like there was a lot of coding for coding's sake so that was sort of the point that Jeff Atwood was making right yeah exactly the that the real job is to solve problems. And for me, it kind of, I ended up kind of coming down to the sense of, of agency and self-direction again, right? The uh, knowing enough to actually be able to act independently and to be able to evaluate independently was the core value. And for some, that's going to be learning to code. Right. You know, and, but, but not necessarily for everybody. Right. And I think, I mean, and I think that we've, you know, we've talked about this a little bit. There's a difference between, I think, hacking, and that is to me, you know, very much about about seize, you know seizing what you what, seizing the tools that you need to sort of solve your own problems and coding, which might be that. And then this more um, more uh, institutional, even sort of idea of becoming a software engineer, architecting software. Now, all of there might be there might be job opportunities that expect anything along that scale, but I think that the learning to code initiative sort of was this one size fits all approach that really didn't meet any of those needs effectively. Okay, so your next trend is the flipped classroom. Yes. Um, and I, um, I want to tell a quick story if you don't mind. Go for so it. So Tuesday night, I've been a little suspicious of the flipped classroom um, sort of as a meme. And uh, on Tuesday night, I interviewed a woman who, uh, Stacy Roshan, who does uh, the flipped classroom in her math class and she actually she does her own recordings mm -hmm. so the idea was sort of flipping the flipped classroom of having the teacher actually do the recordings and um, so I, came, I I was staying with some friends here in Arizona we came out after the interview and I and their daughter's a senior in high school and I was telling them about the interview and the daughter said oh my math teacher does that too mm -hmm. and for the first time in her career her school career this girl doesn't feel stressed out by math. She's actually really enjoying the class. And she said, you know, the, the teacher makes the video and then I go into class and it's really relaxed and we kind of figure things out and I'm finally kind of getting math. And I said, well, is that different, do you think, than sending people to another person's videos, not the teacher's videos? Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, yeah, we have an economics professor who just sends the kids to other people's lectures and people are transferring out of his class. It's the worst class that I have. And I thought that was so interesting to me to see the same practice with a small nuance produce such significantly different results. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll be quiet now and let you tell us about this as a trend. Well, actually, I mean, I, to, to me, that's not surprising. And, and in some ways, the flipped classroom, um, you know, I mean, I taught for a long time, and the flip, I taught, you know, I taught in literature, and the flipped classroom feels very much like the same sort of teaching practices that you do when you teach literature. You assign, you assign a novel to read, the students read the novel outside of the classroom, and then in class, you hold a discussion about what the students have read and learned, and you ask, you know, you ask each other questions, um, and you, you go from, from there. It's not, um, it's not actually sort of lecture-oriented um, topic, or at least when I when I taught it wasn't lecture oriented. So the flipped classroom, this notion of the students doing sort of um, some the students sort of doing a lecture ish or information delivery portion outside of the classroom, and then coming into the class to talk doesn't feel like a new thing. It just feels it feels like um, the way in which some people have taught for a long time. I think that. But it, I do think that this video lecture component, particularly popularized by Sal Khan, and you can see it actually replicated too in many of these other startups that launched this year, really has sort of captured, captured a lot of folks' imagination and this idea that teachers can do something else in the classroom other than lecture. But I mean, I think, I think most teachers do. So I mean, so I would say I share your sort of mixed. I mean, I've had sort of mixed feelings about the flipped classroom as well. It feels like hype more than more than anything. Well, so one of the things that our their friend's daughter said that was so helpful to her was that she could watch the videos over and over, or slow it down, or pause, 
And um, but it was really important that it was her teacher. Hmm. And this was the same thing Stacy said. She said, I can't really build a relationship with my kids unless I'm the one making the videos because I understand where they are and what they're thinking about. Um, and, and then there's also the sort of active creation piece, right? Right. If we, re if we, in fact, you have a line in the post about the, who are you quoting? The best professors at the most prestigious universities in the world. Well, that's, I mean, I think that that's sort of part of, that's sort of part of this, this notion of the, the popularity of the TED Talks. I think that that's some of what the, the new ex MOOCs are sort of offering is this notion that if you, if you watch these lecture, if you watch these lectures, you're really getting it from the best teachers. Um, uh, it, but I, you know, to come back to your point about individual teachers making their own videos, that's a lot of the origins of the flipped classroom. I mean, this is something that Carl Fish did, of course, many years ago with his um, you know, in his algebra classroom, and this was Carl making making videos. Um, so, you know, this notion that all children will learn from Saul Khan is certainly part of the marketing hype. I think lots of teachers have been using this sort of flip um, for a while now. So, if we try the same exercise of looking past the surrogate to the real issues, felt like Shelley Wright was the one who kind of captured that, right? I think so. Yeah, I mean, and this was an interesting sort of almost confessional piece that she wrote this year because she was, I think she was an early adopter of the flip and had been an advocate for this this sort of changing the instructional practices a little bit. And I think what she realized was changing the instructional practices was nowhere near as powerful as actually putting the students in charge. And sort of, you know, she, she I think she became a constructivist this year and sort of that was the phenomenal change in her classroom. It wasn't that she teached, she changed her teaching methods. She actually changed, um, very much changed the way the practice of inquiry um, was in the hands of the students this year and not just in the, in, she wasn't the one in charge. So Stacy, the woman I interviewed, her next goal is to actually have the students produce the videos for each other, mm -hmm. which I thought was a really interesting sort of uh, insight into her own sense of what's important, uh, feeling as though that the, when the students are actually in the role of teacher and creating, that it'll be an even more engaging experience for them. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I think that that's, I think that's a very, that's really powerful. And of course, like I, I note in the, in the piece, there are several you know, several tools that, that are making this, um, making this easier for students to, students to do as well. So that, to me, that's an, exciting, that's an exciting potential of the flip. So do you think there's a connection between what you and I do each week and this sort of larger story? I mean, you, you write the blog posts and prepare them, but, uh, and I read them. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the conversation that really brings them out for me. There's something about conversation which feels as though it's really a critical piece of this that kind of gets missed in, I mean, as we're going to talk about in the MOOCs, right? But even in some of these visions of flipped classroom. I, it, yeah, no, I think you're precisely right. I mean, and I think that that's when, when folks, you know, when folks observe that, that a lecture in the class, a face-to-face -face lecture um, and a videotape lecture are still lectures. I mean, it is still a very, you know, focusing on what, what the teacher says, that instructional piece, instead of having, a, a, you know, a discussion or, or the sort of Socratic method of teaching and learning that, you know, where students are really actively engaged in, in the material. Okay, that's terrific. Okay, so um, then you have a Storify post from a, a conference you went to was the conference called Beyond the Textbook? It was an afternoon um, panel session with myself, David Wiley, and um, um, Lawrence from Lawrence. No, I can't remember his name. Lawrence Holt from uh, Wireless Generation. And it was sort of a conversation starter for a, a longer afternoon workshop that some faculty at NYU participated in. But it was certainly an interesting debate between <laughs> David Wiley and arguing for open textbooks. Um, and then, you know, someone from Wireless Generation and their new um, all-encompassing um, digital content analytics, adaptive learning, tablet-oriented um, thing, <laughs> and then myself. Have I, t have I told you that our daughter signed up for the open high school in Utah? Oh, you did. Yeah, I think that's, yeah. And David had some really interesting 
uh, you know, updates about, about how a lot of things have progressed in Utah. Did, did I tell you that the reason that we took her out was because they locked the laptop down and she couldn't do anything but her coursework on the laptop? Ugh. Yeah, and I imagine that Amplify, you know, it's hard to not imagine that Amplify being the same way, but that's really disappointing with, with um, something with open in the, uh, using open as an adjective. That's so a nice I don't, segue into yeah, I don't want to get off the textbook story, but I, again, it sort of occurred to me that uh, is open this, a surrogate for a deeper issue of ownership, independence, and the like. And so if you have open, if a, they have a commitment to open curricula, but they don't actually implement open policies around the hardware, then is it really open? Well, I mean, and I think, you know, obviously we'll see this with MOOCs. I mean, this is, I think that, that open is is being used, it, open means a lot of things, but I certainly think um, that there's a danger in some of the um, hype around open as being really transformative when it's not necessarily open in all aspects. So help, um, I want to drill down a little bit on the whole textbook concept. Mm -hmm. right? is, it, is it an oversimplification to ask the question of why we even think about textbooks now? I mean, if you have access to source documents and material and you have the ability to aggregate content on the web and curate, why, why is a textbook still even the conversation? I mean, I think it's partly it's the conversation because it's a ten billion dollar a year industry. I mean, I think that that makes it the I think that that makes it the conversation. So the reality is, you know, a five dollar textbook is way better than a hundred dollar textbook, mm -hmm. and it's a stepping stone. But is it seen as a stepping stone? Uh, as is what seen as a stepping stone? Well, I mean, if if, if ultimately. Uh, I'm making this sort of bold claim of, or a question of, do we even need textbooks? Are those who are behind the open textbook movement thinking in that direction, or are they still kind of wed to this idea of a textbook, but just an open one and a cheaper one? I don't know. I mean, I think that there's all sorts. I mean, I think I do think that some some in the open, you know, some folks thinking about open educational resources think about it in a very a traditional way in terms of textbooks and openly, you know, we, then we can have all of the openly licensed materials around that as well. So I would say that there's a range of folks who think about, think about textbooks and think about materials in terms of assignments and assessments, um, and those who think more broadly about the sorts of resources that students would um, use as they, as they learn. Okay, so your next uh, top ed tech trend is MOOCs. <laughs> it's I really, shocking, I know, that MOOCs are a top trend. My daughter keeps calling, so there's this new sort of phrase about not being a hater, right? Mm -hmm. I saw Justin Bieber say something to all the haters out there, and I thought, am I, am I a hater on this <laughs> MOOC issue? Have, I mean, have I just become kind of, you know, the conversations we have, is it just sort of a, um, a rehash every week of this sort of counter story about MOOCs? We're not haters, Steve. We're, you know, Waldorf and Statler in the, in the balcony yes. of the Muppets. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I loved it that you focused on Dave Cormier there and talked about that. Yes. Well, I mean, I think that this is – the MOOCs – I mean, this was actually such a mammoth post. And this, the MOOCs are such – are really an interesting phenomenon in so many ways. And they touch on – a lot of the things that I've already, you know, a lot of the trends that I've already looked at, the, the business of ed tech, for example, this massive amounts of funding that are being poured into, into, into these initiatives, the, 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 you know, questions about business models for higher ed, the learning to code, um, this question of, you know, what, it mean, what things mean to be, um, to be openly licensed, the flipped classroom. Um, but, you know, again, as we hear a lot of the Silicon Valley um, press and excitement about this, this alternative vision of, you know, the, the connectivist MOOC and this tradition that, that, they, that they came from um, was really sort of nowhere to be heard in a lot of the hype around MOOCs, which was really, I think, which is really interesting and I think indicative of the sorts of transformation that these, you know, these ex-MOOCs um, are, are interested in. 
And you you make a comparison between the C MOOCs, mm -hmm. constructivist MOOCs, and the X MOOCs. And you do so first by talking about the technology. To me, this is, this is um, the, the underlying technology is really important here. And interestingly enough, um, you know, the in despite having open, again, despite having open in their name, it's really open only means open enrollment. Um, the, the, the content is oftentimes not openly licensed, and the technology is certainly more akin to a closed learning management system. In fact, strangely enough, you'd think that, I mean, it's pretty indicative that, that a lot of the founders of MOOCs have never looked at a learning management system or asked their students why they hate them because they really have reinscribed the worst possible features of, of the learning management system. Terrible forums, terrible layout, awful UI. Um, it's, it's the learning management system. And the CMOOC has a, you know, the CMOOC is a very different idea of technology. It's distributed. People's contributions live on their own websites. Um, it, it relies on open th open standards like RSS, um, open source tools like WordPress, and it's very much about um, learning in public and not learning behind the walled garden of a, albeit free and open enrollment course. So the next distinction you draw is the pedagogy, and I, I, I'd never heard this, and, and probably just because I haven't paid attention, I love George Siemens description of generative versus declarative knowledge. Right. I mean, and I think that that's very much about this notion, you know, as I said earlier, some of the differences between constructivism as well as, you know, is that are these classes or are we interested in education in filling in the instructors, filling young minds with the knowledge that we've decided they should know? Or do we want to let students help construct their own knowledge? by connecting with other nodes on the network, by building and shaping their, you know, by building and shaping things themselves. And I think that that is a, a huge difference, again, between these different ways of thinking about um, the X MOOCs and the C MOOCs. So the story that comes out of the X MOOC that you loved uh, is the 6.003Z course that was that the students created themselves. Right, and so that's that's, even though in many ways these students have modeled this class on the previous MIT um, X MOOC, they have actually had the agency to go out themselves and they created the materials and opened it up and shared them, you know, shared them online on a wiki. Again, this, a wiki is a very different creature than a learning management system. So the, a wiki sort of invites other people to, coll to collaborate and help build, you know, build the knowledge there. Um, so by you know by far the by far the six point zero zero three z is my one of my most favorite innovations that we've seen in MOOCs this year. Well, I had kind of an epiphany as I read that post because it occurred to me that you know a lot of these sort of long tail ventures, and I've told the story before of my um, skin condition vitiligo, which is the Michael Jackson skin disorder, and how in one night I was able to create a network that's now the world's largest network for people with vitiligo. Mm -hmm. and, and the story for me there is that I didn't have to have funding, right? That I could just sort of, it sort of shifted the power structure yeah. on that kind of activity. And, I, and as I was reading your story, I thought, oh my gosh, the story here isn't these universities building these MOOCs. That's kind of a, a that is a red herring or it's a MacGuffin. Or no, or what, what's our... <laughs> Black Swan, it's a distraction about the Black Swan. But I mean, it's like, it's almost like it's a distraction from the real story that in five or 10 years, the real story will be the technology now enables anybody to create a learning environment for anybody else in the same way that YouTube now is a significant learning tool that most formal education doesn't want to recognize and is trying to duplicate because the fact of the matter is it's completely outside of any kind of power structure. Yeah, and I think that I think that this is what makes again, you know, this is what part of what makes the MOOC trend so fascinating, and um, is that with all of this hype and all of this sort of doom and gloom and hand wringing that this will spark, this will, you know, that MOOCs are going to bring about the end of the university as we know it, that they're going to change everything, that in five years there won't be any more universities, um, that I, I think that that it, it feels as though the, you know, the in some ways, the universe that the that the MOOCs are 
um, the, the, the real radical potential of MOOCs la lies even outside the reasons that those that are, you know, hand-wringing about the, the changing business models. And it is this potential, back to the CMOOC sort of origins, this potential for um, networked learning that doesn't, that doesn't have to look like a closed proprietary model. So you said something in the post that I thought was brilliant, or at least I wrote it down, and if you didn't say it, you can attribute it, but it, that it's, this is not about the learning, but it's about the future of the university. I mean, I, I think that that, that's, that to me feels like a lot of the, a lot of the, the sort of concern and excitement about, about MOOCs. I mean, and rightly so in some ways with the rising cost of tuition. Um, it, and certainly, you know, this notion of opening up access to anyone. But I think there's so many, there's still so many questions about what exactly the X MOOCs look like. Um, uh, and quite, I mean, all, all sorts of questions. And again, not just about the, the pedagogy, not just about access to education, but lots and lots of questions about the politics, the labor, um, you know, the, sort of the Silicon Valley interests, this for profit piece, the data extraction that we're seeing. And so, um, you know, I don't know if this is really, if this particular trend is so much about changing how students learn, but it certainly, it, I think it certainly is um, an interesting trend to watch in terms of the, the future for higher ed. So I don't know that this is accurate, but I'm curious. Uh, last night I interviewed Ray McNulty, who's, um, I can't remember what his position is, I think he's president or vice president at, at, at Penn Chief Foster. Learning Chief learning officer. Yeah, Chief there we go. We actually, yeah, the wisdom of the crowd here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, and and they started in the 1800s. And I, at one point I made a note that they have 150,000 students every year. It's a, a correspondence course and very much geared toward sort of practical skills for job improvement. Is there some way in which universities are nervous about seeding the ground to those who've already been doing this and doing it well? I mean, is there a huge difference between, you know, what Penn Foster does and, and what the MOOC does? See, I mean, I think this is why in some ways this trend, it gets so convoluted and weird because much of the talk this year has, I mean, it's not just that we've forgotten that or, you know, Cormier and Siemens and Downs at all had, you know, doing MOOCs for a really long time. It's that, it's that we've been doing online learning for a really long time. And, and so I think in some ways it just feels as though um, someone, actually plenty of someones, woke up and realized that the, the Internet plus higher education is, is this thing. <laughs> and so, I mean, I think that, I mean, I, I don't know how much this will really change things because I think that despite all of the talk about the destruction of higher ed, what happens at a university, the reason why students go to, to, to university is so much more than just the classes you take. Great. Okay. The, the line of the day, <laughs> Siva Vaidyanathan. <laughs> how did I do? <laughs> I have no idea. How did. You may not know how I did either. I don't know. This may or may not be the dawn of a new technological age for higher education, but it is certainly the dawn of a new age of unfounded hyperbole. Yep, indeed. Great line. Okay, your next post was a little bit personal, right? Yeah. The need for financial support for hack education. Sure. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I, I, um, like I've, I think I've said this before as we've gone through these year-end trend posts. Um, I really love writing them, but they are... Um, they take a lot of work and a lot of time and energy. Of course, this is what I do. But as I finished up, you know, as I made it through the halfway point of these, I thought, you know, I'm just going to remind folks that I am one of the few um, independent uh, ed tech journalists out there that I don't advertise. I'm not, you know, I haven't been invested in by the same venture capitalists that I cover. And so uh, I thought I'd remind folks that there's a donate button. There wasn't a subtle reference there, was there? Maybe. <laughs> well, okay, so I, I mean, I think, the bottom you know, line is open your checkbooks. This is the fundraising drive for hack right. education. The phone banks are open. The phone banks are open. Right. Send Audrey some love. <laughs> okay, so news. 
news. Uh, I'm not sure I ever expected to see a story that included uh, uh, Arnie Duncan uh, and the word male strip, the phrase male stripper together. <laughs> But <laughs> what's going on there? Well, The Onion wrote, um, The Onion had a very uh, hilarious piece about in order to sort of help pay for, you know, the rising cost of education that, that, that our Secretary of Education was going to have to take on a second job as a male stripper in order to earn a little extra cash. Um, and funnily enough, the following week, Tom Friedman penned this sort of love letter to Arne Duncan saying that he thought that Arne Duncan was the best possible candidate for Secretary of State, which, um, yeah, I don't... <laughs> <laughs> but Arne Duncan's response was that, which I thought was hilarious, that he thought that, he said that the Onion was probably more accurate than Tom Friedman, which I don't even know how to interpret the probably. Is it that... He's probably not going to be Secretary of State, or that he's probably going to have to look into male stripping. I don't know. But Do we know? Is there, has there been any news about Arnie or about Karen Cater? Um, I haven't heard any news about Arnie Duncan, but there certainly has been a lot of pretty high-profile departures from the Department of Education. I mean, Karen Cater included. But it looks like I mean, just the last week, I think the secretaries, the press secretary. Um, uh, said that he was leaving as well. So I think lots of folks are abandoning ship. Is this a sign of anything? I have no idea. I think that's how it goes. I think that's the cycle. I think they work for a little while in the Department of Education, then you get a job at the Gates Foundation, and then you go back to the Department of Education. So I think it's just the cycle. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I would love to know if there's more, but my guess is that the the soft politics would make it hard to even ever sort of describe that. But it does seem like someone as dynamic as Karen would have it at some level to disagree with some of what's going on. I, I don't know. I mean, and I, you know, having, I don't know, Washington, D.C. and the machinations there seem like a very odd place. So I'm not, I'm not sure I could read no, too I'm much not, into I, it. I'm not putting words into Karen's mouth, and she's never said anything that would indicate that to me. But I, it, it would just seem like there is a sort of a dilemma for somebody who, um, any anybody in that position, given the policies. Okay, so um, this this data about high school graduation rates, mm -hmm. both last week and this week, and this week there was actually some sort of drill down um, on it, right? About uh, some of the. The, uh, the trends that were indicated there, although you can't actually compare previous years because of being calculated differently. Right, right. So they were, the Department of Education sort of revised its calculation method. So as you say, you, can't, you won't be able to compare California this year with California in previous years, but certainly for right now we can compare the states against one another. And the data is also really interesting in terms of some of the discrepancies within a state on on graduation rates, so the difference between sort of um, the, the rates with, at which black students graduate versus white students versus Hispanics. So this is a case where uh, it, it's a reminder of the value of data. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've done some criticism of sort of the the use of data as a um, as a solution designed to you know creating a problem to fit the solution where large companies have lots of data but certainly we learned something from this kind of data that's really valuable right i think so i mean and i think you know we can particularly around some of these these sort of continued opportunity gaps that, um, that we're seeing uh, and in places where i think it's you know important to highlight that you know a state like connecticut for example is always praised for having a high graduation rate, and it does, except for the poor students in Connecticut have an abysmal graduation rate. And so I think to be able to, t you know, to be able to ask questions about what exactly is happening and to whom um, is, is really important. So in, in this week's news also, you do uh, mention that Coursera has announced that they're going to start selling student data to recruiters and employers. Yeah. It, and this seems like it's a pretty big deal, right? I think this will be, I mean, this is already the business model that Udacity is pursuing. They're certainly um, positioning themselves to be the sort of talent pipeline for Silicon Valley. Um, 
you know, I mean, it's not, it's not, again, it's not so much that these, that they are necessarily training students. I think they are in part, but they're able to identify students who perform really well, and they're making the connection between those students and tech companies, and then Udacity, and now Coursera will get sort of a, a hefty finder's fee, which is, you know, the recruitment business is, is, is pretty hopping right now in Silicon Valley. Yeah, I'm not sure I've highlighted this, but you do have another story about the amount of money being spent by for-profit institutions, right? Mm -hmm. Do we know how much of that money is uh, in the arena of sort of buying applicants? Um, I don't know. It, I think it was just ads that the that the USA. Are you talking about the USA Today story? I, I think I must be. I didn't make a note of it, so I don't remember exactly. Yeah, but this was this was about. Um, uh, at the K-12 level, the USA Today did a, a re, uh, reported on the amount of money that for-profit K-12 through online schools spend on advertising. And of course, these this is your tax dollars at work. So this story about technologies impacting uh, and social media impacting students' GPAs, mm -hmm. revealing? I think that, you know, I think that um, Ray Junko does some pretty interesting work. Um, he's, you know, looking at um, looking, looking at how social media, um, just you know, despite all of the hullabaloo about you know Facebook being used for education, Twitter being really useful for education, um, he looks, you know, he looks to see if if really um, that's the case. He's he's found that, which I thought was really interesting, that texting and Facebooking during class were negatively related to G to GPA, that suggests that those students were probably distracted, whereas if they were emailing or searching, that they didn't have the same impact. I mean, it to me it makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of times where you're listening to something and you do a related search because it jogs an idea in your brain. I think that that's, you know, again, to, to, to go back to George Siemens, like that's, gener like that's generative knowledge building. Um, and so this isn't too surprising. Interesting. Yeah, I, it seemed intuitive to me as well. Um, and I've also recognized that every once in a while I'll still hear a story about a professor who asks the students to turn their computers off in class. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, – I, I know the intention there is the thought that it's distracting. But sort of intriguingly, my ability to make note of and follow threads is kind of how my brain works. And I suspect that that's true for a lot of people, that we don't think in a purely linear fashion. And that the web actually kind of really accelerates my learning in those circumstances where I can be looking things up at the same time. Exactly. Right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> best school name ever. Hacker High School. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was an interesting project that just happened to catch my eye. Um, Hacker High School offers um, – I mean, they – they offer security and privacy lessons to students. Um, it's sort of a unit's curriculum on how to teach students about, about um, internet security um, as well as privacy. I think that these are very important skills that we just don't communicate, um, communicate to folks. And so they've, they've upgraded or updated their lessons. And so I think we go into business with them, hire Gary Steger and run it as an actual school, <laughs> Hacker High School. I was so upset. I was there. Gary came to last week's Hacker Education event, uh -huh. Gary and Sylvia, and Kane's Arcade was closed that weekend. Oh, that's too bad. I know. So Gary actually went into – he teaches at a school, and he actually brought cardboard in and did all kinds of projects with the kids in the school using cardboard. Awesome. Okay. Hey, I'm really excited. So I can now watch a Khan Academy video and get credit for it. I mean, on, your, I, on your iPhone, not on your I'm, Android. Sorry. Oh, now I'm just <laughs> devastated because I, I only watch those videos in order to get some kind of external validation that I'm following instructions correctly. Well, now iOS owners can delight. No longer do they need to use the native YouTube app on their phones, but they can use the specially designed Khan Academy app so that they can continue to earn badges as they watch videos. <laughs> <laughs> okay, from, this is from last week's news. The line of the news post for me. This is from um, Norian Caporale Berkowitz. Oh, yes. Who yes. says that Coursera is exploring using its power users as community TAs, teaching assistants. Right. right. Quote, the idea is to give these power users the sense 
that they're contributing and helping to build this with us. They're not actually helping to build and contributing, but we want them to have the sense that they are. Well, they might get special certificates, right? <laughs> and so maybe their data gets pushed to the head of the line and they get the special interview first with Google. Uh, the, the wording of that was flabbergasting to me. Right. And it's, you know, I mean, as someone who spent a long time in graduate school and, you know, paid my way through, uh, in part by, by getting, you know, by getting a paycheck for doing things, uh, to, for doing the TA job, I do find this notion of like volunteering, <laughs> volunteering as a TA to be ludicrous. I mean, it's great. I mean, the idea of, of, commu of using your community well, awesome. The idea of calling it a TA and then not paying people, it seems a little insulting to me. Audrey, as usual, you have been enlightening. <laughs> Welcome back from Paris, France. Thank you, thank you. I'm, I, it was very interesting to spend five days without the internet. I mean, there were brief times when I was able to get uh, Wi-Fi, but it, that, um, that was really interesting to me. As someone who was very connected, uh, it was it was shocking to to have to go without, especially looking, <laughs> trying to find my way without uh, GPS was hard. I'm sure <laughs> we would all have the same experience. <laughs> hey, have a great week. Thanks, Steve. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.